All right, first question. Doesn't the fact that more students are taking the ACT mean you are automatically going to have lower scores on it and the MME? So that's probably... Yeah. <laughs> um, does it automatically mean? Uh, not automatically, but that's generally the way it works. When you increase the pool of students who are taking a standardized test like the ACT or the SAT, um, generally scores will go down because you're bringing people into the pool who would not necessarily be going to college who are going to be the lower achievers. So the warning there, and I think Brian alluded to this, um, it's not so much worried about the time trends here in Michigan, but it's comparing Michigan to other states. There are a small number of states, uh, Illinois is one I can think of, that are requiring the ACT of all students in high school. But if you're now going to try to compare ACT scores in Michigan to other ACT states that don't have universal test taking, um, difficult exercise, so I do it with caution. Yeah, I mean, I would just say the researchers could probably defend their research better, but the point is as you move to that stage, you're using student level data in, in the, you're not seeing it up here, but we are, they're controlling for these kinds of factors, right? So you're going to make sure that you're comparing, you know, conditional on things like who's taking the test. Uh, you know, when you go make those comparisons, I know you're both much better at that kind of work than I am, so you'll, you'll do that. Yeah, this is more hypothesizing, but do we know how many years on average are needed for districts and stats to make changes in KL, K through 8, I think it says preparations, to support new high school requirements? How long should this take? Uh, I mean, this, is, this is a great question. I, I think the answer is we don't know. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why we don't know very well is other cases that are uh, similar in terms of, of policy reform weren't particularly well studied necessarily. And, and so uh, this is a huge gap. I mean, I, I think the theory of action would suggest, of course, that, that these are not uh, instantaneous changes, right? This is something that it takes a long time uh, for various reasons to implement. The question is how long is, is long. And so, I, you know, I think that's one of the things we hope to learn. Uh, certainly, I hope to learn uh, from following this project uh, further. Okay. How can we think about the alignment of federal goals and policies with the state's goals and policies? For example, setting and measuring standards, Michigan Merit Curriculum versus the Common Core. How do they interact? How do they relate? And what would the impacts be? Again, this is a this is a key question. I didn't bring up the, the waiver, or we call the ESEA flex or flexibility around uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Uh, but this is a, a place uh, where where that intersection is is taking place right now, right? So where uh, the, the Secretary Duncan and our administration uh, went out and said, "Look, no child left behind uh, is not." is not working, right? It's not making sense as we approach 2014 that 100% of kids are going to be proficient and states are uh, clamoring for relief uh, uh, from some of these constraints as more and more schools are not making, uh, meeting their AMOs or their annual measurable objectives. Uh, states are saying, you know, you got to let us do something else other than what this policy is requiring us to do. And so uh, unfortunately, as you probably know, everybody here knows, uh, this uh, Title I, the ESEA, was supposed to be reauthorized. It was due for reauthorization in 2007. Actually, I was in the previous administration in the department then and when it didn't happen. Uh, and so we are extremely overdue uh, uh, for Congress sort of addressing this law. And, and the Secretary, Secretary Doug, had, uh, and, and the President said that's, that, uh, you know, we wish that Congress would have, have taken this up, but this is not, it's not good enough just to, to hope that they get there someday. And so there is a, a provision uh, in the law which allows the Secretary to grant flexibility around those requirements, which is why we, we launched into these waivers. Uh, I know Michigan uh, just got theirs, I think, in June. It was a sort of a, a, unfortunately not, not one of the first uh, rounds of, of waivers. But the point there was to allow the states 
uh, flexibility to go to the department and say, here's how we'd rather do this, right? So if you're talking about the intersection of state and federal policy, you know, the, we, the federal government, the, the administration at least, our side was saying, we think this is overly prescriptive and it's not making sense for states. We do have some, some goals. You need to target, you know, you need to focus on improving education for the lowest performing students, but they don't necessarily all have to be concentrated in the lowest performing schools. Uh, and you also need to make sure that kids are college and career ready. Now we could have that debate for a very long time, and, and on my in my seat where I sit, and I hear them say that over and over again, I'm like, well, we don't even know how to measure that very well. Uh, you know, I, I worry about that a lot, but I 100% I support the fact that that's that makes sense as a goal. And I think the key here is is so states found different ways to do that. A lot of them did adopt the ACT. A lot of the folks who in their waiver package said we will show college and career readiness using something like the ACT, which has benchmarks for college and career readiness. So whether or not you think th those are uh, adequately predictive or valid for what they say they are is another question. There's some interesting research in that area. But I think the point is, that at least in, in this wave, the, the federal government wants to listen to the states and figure out how they'd rather meet these objectives. I think that, you know, you talked about this being a confound uh, for this work, which is absolutely true. And if we're lucky, it's going to get worse, unfortunately, for, for you guys, because we will reauthorize, uh, hopefully, in the next couple of years. And then we'll see a new uh, Title I. And hopefully, uh, the, the administration, whoever's in, in office at that time, will listen to the states uh, and, and make sure that it makes sense. All right, we've got a dozen more questions and time for one. Three of the questions <laughs> sent around a topic for this afternoon. Uh, Ken Franks will be talking to us about the Michigan Merit Curriculum and teacher compositional change. I think several questions really around what are we doing to make sure our teachers are well prepared? Do we have a teacher supportage in key areas? Um, so we'll get to that this afternoon. Um, one question in particular talks about the MSU collaborative how will MSU collaborate with the new Education Achievement Authority as they work with the focus and priority schools? You started to address that with your comments. Yeah, we're, you know, as, as Jack said, the state just received its waiver in like June. Uh, the MDE put together the Michigan Excel program, working with us and other partners over the summer. And we um, literally in the space, space of a month had to staff up and hire about 75 people to staff our work in the focus and priority schools. And we are right now in discussions with um, the EAA about whether we're going to be working with them. It's sort of a little bit of a strange situation because on the one hand, uh, some of their schools show up on the list of focus and priority schools. On the other hand, they're a brand new operator or runner, whatever verb you want to use of these schools, noun you want to use of these schools. Um, so we're in conversation right now with them about uh, whether in fact we'll be working with them under Michigan Excel or not. And um, I think we'll have an answer to that pretty soon. I'd like to thank Commissioner Buckley and Dean Heller for their time with us today and for bringing their expertise and views of the national and Michigan environment.